Hey guys, it's me, Portia Collins here, and I am so excited to be back with you with another YouTube video. Um, today, we're going to just be talking a little bit about um, emotions and anger and um, a lot of current events. Uh, and I hate to use the word current events because um, I don't think that we should look at um, when the, there is a loss of life, um, when people are being treated unjustly and when things are just going awry i don't think we should just call them current events and just you know brush it off as if it's just something else for us to be in the know about or entertained about and so um forgive me for saying that but um we're going to look at a couple of things that that's happening now and just honestly I want to walk through um, my own way of processing this. And so if you know anything about me, you will know that it is aimed or gold um, to always filter things through the lens of scripture. And so uh, let me back up in case you are unaware of what's going on. Um, if you have been living under a rock, which no judgment, but um, sometimes, you know, people are not aware of things that are happening in the media um, or um, just whatever's going on outside of your own little circle. And so recently, um, a gentleman by the name of George Floyd um, was arrested. And during the process of him being arrested, he was murdered basically. Um, an officer um, placed his knee on his neck as he was pinned down. He was handcuffed. Um, I have not watched the videos, but I've, you know, I, first of all, I have a rule that I really don't watch videos like this. And it's not because I don't want to be aware, but it's because it's traumatic. And just seeing the images, I saw the images on my Facebook um, and my Instagram and just seeing the images, that was enough but also just reading um, the accounts of what happened. And um, it has been explained that, like I said, there was, I saw the picture with the officer and his knee on um, Mr. Floyd's neck. And then there, to my understanding, were maybe three other officers also pin, pinning this gentleman down and he couldn't breathe. And he subsequently died. Um, and we know, um, I'm, I'm, go I'm going to assume that you know, that this is not the first time that this has happened. Um, from Mike Brown to uh, Ahmaud Arbery to um, Botham Jean or Jean, I'm not sure how his last name is pronounced. Um, but I mean, literally, I could list so many names, um, so many names, and it grieves me, and it angers me, um, because this keeps happening, and it's almost as if so many people have turned a blind eye to it, um, that, I mean, it's just, I mean, I'm, I'm really lost for words to describe how I feel and how what I have perceived um, throughout the years as it relates to, um, you know, race related issues. And as I've been thinking, like I, I remember um, earlier this week when I found out about um, the murder of Mr. Floyd, I um, I just got really like anxious and I couldn't sleep and just really trying to process my thoughts and my emotions and my feelings. And you know that the media and voices, everybody is like literally throwing things at you. And um, everybody is trying to, I, I will say this, I, I, trying to condition the way that you think and how you process these things. And the reason why I say everybody is because that's just, honestly, 
Satan works that way. Satan is going to try to use any type of means that he could possibly use to condition your mind and your response and your thoughts. And so for me, it's like, Lord, well, how do I deal with these emotions or these feelings or these thoughts? How do I deal with these and express them in a way that still um, holds you supreme, not my emotions, um, that still glorifies you, but also doesn't whitewash a problem, a horrific problem that continues to happen. So I guess that's the premise here of this video is um, how I kind of ended up here. It was just like literally talking to God and praying and seeking to um, process in a way that is not so much influenced by what people are saying or what the media is saying, but by what God says and how God says um, or calls me to deal with things, to respond to things. And so the first thing is, it would be a lie to say that God um, doesn't want us to have emotions or that it's bad to have emotional responses um, to things. It's okay to grieve. It's okay to lament. I often talk about this when I speak of the Psalms. The Psalms are a perfect example of what it looks like to have emotions as a Christian. You see a wide range of, of um, expressions in the Psalms. You see the lament, you see the thanksgiving, you see the praise, you see the anger. Um, and so I'm, I'm not going to sit here and, and tell you that, you know, there's a blanket um, for how you should feel. Um, but there is a way to filter those things in a way that is glorifying to God and that, like I said, still holds God supreme. My fear, um, and this is always my fear, is that people either lean too far this way or too far that way. And what I mean by that, that is you have people who say, well, you know, there's just trust Jesus, just preach the gospel, excuse me. Um, just focus on this. And while there may be some validity to that, yes, the gospel is most important. That doesn't take away the practical implications of the gospel. And so it's like, how does preaching the gospel and living the gospel out actually bring about the change that we need to see? And so on the flip side, this side, you have people who focus so much on the change and so much um, on trying to um, impart um, wisdom or admonish people without or with you know they they roll around the gospel but they never really you know hone in on the gospel and so like this is where I want people to know that there is overlap between the two yes God is supreme. The gospel is important. Um, living in a way that glorifies God and doing those things that glorify him are most important, but there are practical implications for how that looks. And so once again, this is what, like, uh, these are all the thoughts, everything um, that's been going through my mind. And, and honestly, this is why this video is a video and not a blog post, because I wanted to write, but I was struggling so to capture my thoughts and words. And I was like, okay, this is why I got a YouTube channel to be able to process in a different way. And so um, again, this is how we ended up here. And so as I was just talking and, and praying and just seeking God, like, what do I do with this? What do I do with the, what I feel? What do I do with, you know, everything, you know, I don't, I, you know, and then you're concerned I, I will, I'll be the first to admit that sometimes I do struggle with, you know, I don't want people to think that I don't care. And then I also don't want people to think that my Christian priorities are out of whack, you know, and then like, God reminds me, okay, scratch all this thinking about what people think and what they say. What am I saying to you? What is it that 
eye, you know, what is, what, you know, where is your gaze, Portia? And this is where I end up in his word. And so crazy thing, I'm literally laying in the bed the other night, just wrestling with my thoughts, wrestling with everything. And like, ding, thought pops in my head, Jonah. Jonah, why? Why am I going to Jonah? And I know this may be a little bit of charismatic for some people, but I don't care because this is how it happened. So it's like the thought of Jonah pops into my mind. And so I was like, okay, let's go and read Jonah. And, you know, I'm already familiar with the book of Jonah. And so I'm like, I don't really understand why this is relevant. And as I continue to read and continue to meditate, um, I get to the fourth chapter and this is where I see, um, I guess what God wants me to see right now in this moment. And so in the fourth chapter, uh, let me even back up before we even get there. Um, the book of Jonah starts with, and let me find my notes, because I did take a couple of notes just to give you some context. Jonah was a prophet. We know that. The most thing, the biggest thing that we know about Jonah is Jonah was swallowed up in the belly of a fish. Um, some people think that this is like uh, this story in the Bible or this book is more of an, like an allegory or a parable, but I actually think this is what it is. This is a historical um, account of something that happened, even though it may seem very um, whimsical or whatever. I just, I believe that this is the way that this happened. And so, um, and, and I think the thing is, is don't get me wrong. The fish is important, but the fish is not the most important thing. And that's what I want us to zone in on. So let's just back up, give you some context. Jonah, prophet. Um, Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh. God had told Jonah to go to Nineveh to basically, you know, preach to these people and tell them, unless you repent, it's about to be some trouble. You know, I'm about to tear this place up. And so y'all know I love to paraphrase. And so just go along with me here. Um, but this is what God tells Jonah to do. He says, go to Nineveh. This is what you want to, this is what I want you to do. All right. So even in chapter one, like we don't even get a whole lot of, you know, fluff before we see that Jonah is just like, nah, not going to do it. Going the opposite di direction to Tarshish. Tarshish. I can never say it right. Y'all know what I'm talking about, okay? And so he's like, I'm going the opposite direction. Um, and in um, Jonah's disobedience, this is when God sends the fish to swallow him up and basically redirects Jonah to go where God really originally wanted him to go, all right? Now, so we got all of that. We know that we think that this story, a lot of times we say, okay, this is because, you know, when God gives you a word or when he tells you to do something, you need to go do it. Yeah, absolutely. But there is something more here. I want us to keep digging. Okay. All right. We need another little, little more backdrop. Let me get my glasses here. So Nineveh, um, what is this place, Nineveh? Why is this relevant? Why is it important that they, that uh, Jonah goes to Nineveh to tell them to repent. And so the the nugget here or or the thing that you want to know about Nineveh is that Nineveh is or was at that time the capital city of the Assyrian Assyrian Empire. And so if you know anything about the Assyrians, Assyrians and Israelites, they did not mix, okay? Um in fact, after this book is dated, I think around somewhere between 793, um, 793 BC, 753 BC, somewhere in between there. And so not long after that, the um, Assyrians actually conquer Israel, the Northern Kingdom of Israel. And so, um, you know, I mean, at the time, even before this, ha it's almost like they know this is looming. This is going to happen. And so they, there's already bad blood between the two nations. All right. And so they didn't mix. And so Jonah being a 
prophet of Israel is like, I don't want to go over here and talk to these people. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to preach to them. You know, he's really angry with them because honestly, if you look at the life of the Israelites and the Assyrians, they were like two totally different people. Um, the, Assyri the Israelites had been given God's word and they were commanded to live a certain way and um, were not to be idolaters and things like that. Whereas the Assyrians, they had, you know, pagan gods, they worshiped pagan gods and they did vile and grotesque things and so um they were just like enemies because basically this nation was unapologetically sinful and um this nation was israel was sinful but um they were more of a i guess you would say a law-keeping nation a nation who knew god all right and so the interesting thing about this book is that um this prophet preaches so Jonah is not just, um, this may be applicable. And of course, Israelites may read this particular book um, or there may be some things that are applicable to them, but he's not called to preach to them. If you look at all the other prophets, um, most of them are preaching to the Israelites. Repent, turn around. You've been co-mingling with folks that, you know, are idolaters and doing all these things repent you know wash your hands ye sinners all of that excuse me and so um this is what you see in other uh books like jeremiah isaiah they are preaching to israelites whereas jonah is told to go preach to a nation outside of israel so this is interesting too because it's like god why do you include this in the bible you know like what what are you showing what are you illustrating to us here so keep that in mind he pre he sends jonah to preach to a nation outside of the chosen nation okay all right also the prophetic message that is um revealed through the words that are preached by jonah is not this prophetic message is not just found in the words of Jonah and what he's saying to the people at Nineveh, but the prophetic message is seen all throughout this narrative. What we need to take away from this is not just um, found in what is explicitly said from Jonah or even God, um, which are both important things, but it is seen all, it's like woven all throughout this. Hope you guys are following me because I'm getting to a point, all right? Just stay with me, all right? I'm going to tie it all in. And so um, basically, like I said, Jonah um, goes to preach to the, these people who are not his people. He's told to preach repentance to these people who are not his people, possibly people who are maybe threatened him. They probably giving each other the side eye when they see each other in the streets, things like that. And it's like, Jonah don't want to do that. He doesn't want to do it. Why? Why does Jonah not want to do it? Is it because he's afraid? No. A lot of people think that it's because he lacks boldness or that he's, you know, he feels some type of way like, I don't know if I can do this. That's not why. I'm going to read to you why Jonah doesn't want to do this. We're going to start at chapter four. And uh, I'm just going to read until, <laughs> until I feel like stopping. And so chapter four, verse one. Um, actually, I'm going to back up a little bit. Let's go to chapter three. And verse 10, I'm going to do the last verse there. And then I'm gonna, I may give a little comment here. So verse 10, I'm reading from the CSB today. Um, this is my, what is this? Apologetic study, study Bible. Love this Bible. Um, and y'all know I'm a Bible collector. So I like to share with y'all um, what I'm using. <laughs> All right. So verse 10 um, in chapter three of Jonah, it says, God saw their actions and they had turned from their evil ways. So God relented from the disaster he had threatened them with and he did not do it. All right. So basically Jonah, God tells Jonah, go to Nineveh, preach, do this. Jonah doesn't want to go, says I'm going in the opposite direction. Jonah gets swallowed up by the fish, gets turned back around to go to Nineveh as God has told him then he does as God has told him and he preaches repentance um to them and um then they repented the people of Nineveh repented 
God sees their actions and he sees that they turn from their evil ways and he relents in um, sending this great disaster upon them and um, he doesn't do it, okay? All right, and so verse one in chapter four, I'm gonna start reading here. And it says, in response to this, check this out. Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. He prayed to the Lord, please, Lord, isn't this what I thought while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled toward Tarshish. Y'all not brutalize this word, so whatever. <laughs> That's why I fled toward Tarshish <laughs> in the first place. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and one who relents from sending disaster. Y'all, sorry about my baby, if y'all can hear in the background. I've waited long enough to record it this, to record this video, so I gotta go ahead and go with it. So pardon her. Um, and now, Lord, take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Whew. So check this out. If you didn't follow me, I'm gonna recap this for you. People of Nineveh, they repent. God sees their repentance. He sees that they turn from their evil ways. He spares them. Jonah's response, he is livid. Look at the words that describe what he feels. He's greatly displeased and furious. And why? Why is he mad? He said, because he was like, I knew you were going to do this. This is why I didn't want to come here in the first place. It's like, that's why I fled toward um, another city in the first place, because I didn't want to come here and preach repentance to, to, repentance to these people. They repent, and then you be loving and compassionate and forgiving to them. He's like, you know what? Just take me now. It's better for me to die, because I don't want to deal with this. Mm. And we read this sitting outside of that. And we're like, how can he be this way? How can he be so ungracious? But Lord, don't we do the same thing? Don't we do the same thing? I'm going to keep going. Verse four. The Lord asks, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah left the city and found a place east of it. He made himself a shelter there and sat in it, its shade to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God appointed a plant and it grew over Jonah to provide shade for his head, to rescue him from his trouble. Jonah was greatly pleased with the plant. When dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant and it withered. And the sun was rising. God appointed a scorching east wind. The sun beat down on Jonah's head so much that he almost fainted and he wanted to die. He said, it's better for me to die than to live. Here Jonah go again. Let me die, Lord. Just let me die. Then the Lord asked, then God asked Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plan? And Jonah says, yes, it's right. I'm angry enough to die. And so the Lord said, you cared about the plant, which you did not labor over and did not grow. It appeared in a night and perished in a night. But may I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people who cannot distinguish between their right and their left, as well as many animals. So basically, God is showing, um, I guess the biggest thing, the, the illustration that we see here is the illustration of divine justice and divine mercy. And both lie in the hands 
of God. All right. Both of them. My message or my plea to you is this based my takeaway. Don't be like Jonah. Don't elevate anger so high in your life that it rains over your life, that you become uncommitted to the mission that God has set before you because you have placed anger on a dangerous pedestal, a place where it should not be. And I think this is something that we often forget about is that things, um, material things are not just, th those are not the only things that can make us become um, idolaters. Even, basically, idolatry is elevating anything above God. And that includes our own emotions. Even if it may be a valid response, I'm not telling you to not be angry or not be sad or to not, you know, um, deal or wrestle with things. But I am telling you to filter every part of that through the word of God. And so the question that we should always be asking ourselves is how do I continue to do God's work even in the midst of this, in the midst of an injustice, in the midst of um, everything that's going on? How do I continue to do God's work without whitewashing what's going on but also making sure that I am laser focused on what God has called me to do. That's what I want you to take away. I don't want you to not call out injustice. Like I said, I don't want you to pretend that it doesn't exist, but I don't want you to be bound by feelings and emotions and thoughts that ultimately are being born inside of you to distract you from the mission that God has set before you. Satan is crafty. Satan is crafty. And he will use every little thing, even seemingly good things, to try to distract us from what God has set in front of us. We got to be aware. We got to know. We have to stay focused. Also, when it comes to anger, you should not love your anger or your resentment or whatever it is more than you love God and what God calls you to do. Jonah didn't want to preach repentance to these people. And y'all, I hate to tell you, but some of us have that problem. We really don't want to preach repentance to some people because we don't want to see them repent. We don't want to see the change. Sometimes we get the feel that we need by holding on to our anger. We want it. And I'm telling you to let it go and for real give it to God, the one who holds all things in his hand, the one who practices divine justice and divine mercy at his choosing. I know this may not be the message that people want to hear right now, but I'm compelled to, to speak it anyway because what I don't want is, I don't want us, particularly I'm speaking to believers, I don't want believers to get burdened and distracted so much by things that are going on that we just miss our opportunities to truly live for the glory of God, to truly avail ourselves, all parts of us, even our emotions, to the work of the Lord. You can't love anything more than you love him. Not even your anger, even if it is justifiable. Even if it is, I'm not going to tell you that you don't have a right to be angry. I'm mad, but I cannot esteem that um, to a place that makes me become um, oblivious or even 
nonchalant about the mission of God. I have a responsibility to preach the gospel to all people, through all things, over and over and over. That is my primary responsibility to preach the gospel. Also to live the gospel. So like I said, there are practical implications. I don't want to just throw the blanket of the gospel over a problem and we forget and say, oh, I don't see color or I don't see, you know, these issues aren't really happening. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we must be careful to preach and to live and to call others to live out what we know to be true according to God's word. I'm not, I'm not going to say that this isn't hard for me to say, to deliver, but it's necessary. And I just, I cannot say it enough. I genuinely hope and pray um, that we, my husband is so loud. I'm so sorry, y'all. <laughs> um, but I genuinely hope and pray that we can continue um, to build God's kingdom in spite of what we see it's hard this world will never ever yield um, the results or um, those things that our souls really long for you're not going to find it there's going to be trouble on every hand and my grandma used to say trouble on every hand until the Lord comes back. And he'll make all things new. But until then, we can grieve, let us lament, let us cry out to God, but let us remain focused and um, yielded, availing ourselves to the cause of God in all things. Don't let your anger turn you into a Jonah. Don't let your anger keep you from doing what God wants you to do. That's not your job. Your, that's not your job. God is God and you are you. And so God knows how to work all things. And one day he will judge all. There will not be one for anybody that is not covered under the blood of Jesus Christ they won't be able to escape the wrath of God. And Lord knows that's not something I don't pray or seek or wish that on anybody. I really don't. I, it, is, it is my just desire that all would come to repentance. I know that all won't because that's what the Bible tells me. But I'm going to keep on preaching the gospel and hope. And um, just live in a way that um, causes people or prompts people to examine themselves and turn from their sin. And so there may have been a huge ramble, but that's what I want to share with you guys today. And I hope that it is a blessing to you. Um, before we leave, can I just pray with you really quickly um, before my family gets louder again? <laughs> All right, Father, we love you. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are a um, ever merciful, compassionate, forgiving, loving God. Lord, we thank we are thankful that um, you don't give up on us, Lord, that you continue to refine us and um, chasten us um, in a way that is good for us and brings you glory. Lord, we thank you that you continue to sit on the throne, Lord, that we don't have to be the ones to make all the, all the decisions and to do all the things, um, that we can trust you uh, to continue to hold all things in balance, to work all things um, to the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. 
Lord, right now, I pray for every person who sits under the, under the sound of my voice, who is weary, who is angry, who is tired and frustrated, Lord. Lord, I pray that you will just rejuvenate them and continue to stir them um, in a way that keeps them focused and constantly clinging to you in all things, Lord. Help us to see that our hope is not in this world. Our hope is not in other people. Our hope is not in things. Our hope is not in feelings, but our hope is only in you, God. Help us to remain committed to your mission. Help us con to continue to be kingdom builders, Lord. Help us to boldly call out evil and injustice and to rebuke when necessary, Lord. Help us to compassionately call people to repentance, Lord, even when we're angry, even when we um, are like, filled with um, repulsion by somebody's actions, Lord. Lord, let us continue to preach the gospel in all things. And Lord, just forgive us for our many sins, for our pride, for our disobedience. Lord, I can't number the things and the ways that I disappoint you and that I sin against you, Lord. And I thank you that you are a merciful God who forgives me over and over again. Lord, I thank you for the blood that was shed on Calvary for the pardoning of my sins. Lord, I am not worthy. And Lord, I need you to help me to remember that when I pridefully walk around as if I am owed salvation. Lord, I am a sinner in need of grace daily. Help me to remember that and to submit in your way in all things, God. Lord, help me to be a light in this dark world. Help all believers to be a light that reflects and shows who you are to a dying world. And Father, we will be forever careful to give you all the praise and all the glory forever and ever. It is in Jesus Christ's name that I pray. Amen. All right, y'all. Y'all have a good one. Bye.